We're beginning today a series going through the Acts of the Apostles chapter by chapter to see how the early church was founded. And Acts was written about the mid 80s, 60s, and really is the story of the of how Christians, Jews, took the message of Christ to the Gentiles. And Acts 28, the last verse, records the reason Acts was written. It says, therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And we're grateful to the early church, to the Jews of the early church. You know, there have been much uh, anti-Semitism is, a, is, a, is quite a worldwide thing these days, and, but it's a spiritual issue. Why anti-Semites? What do they, why are they so against the Jews? God's chosen people. And I'm so grateful to them that they had an encounter with Jesus and continued to share that message with us today. Acts was written by Luke. Who was Luke? Luke was not one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was a Gentile convert to Christianity and he was a physician. And as a physician, he was a man who was careful to follow his observations and was detailed in his conclusions. He was a man of culture, which is evidenced by the way in he wrote and the language that he used when he wrote. He wrote the account of the birth ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus, and then, then followed on with an account of the early church being birthed, the Acts of the Apostles. So he wrote the gospel first and then carried on and wrote Acts. He wrote as a, a, over a quarter of the New Testament is from the pen of Luke. And this is what he writes in Luke 1 to 4. When he opens that, he says, in as much... Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Inasmuch as we have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled amongst us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also. All right, so he's laying out and saying, Right from the very beginning, we were all aware of what happened in the last few years. He's probably writing this within the uh, lifespan of many people. There were certainly hundreds still alive who had personally met Christ. And he said, having had perfect understanding of all these things. Here's the physician speaking. He knew what he was writing about. From the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So really he's saying these things, perfection and certainty are two of the personal characteristics or characteristic traits of Luke, the physician. He was interested in the truth. He was also, at times, a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Certainly, he was on Paul's second, third, and fourth journey, as we shall see as we go through. And uh, how do we know this? Because Luke uses the personal pronoun, we, to write about the three journeys in Acts. You'll find him writing about using that we, talking about himself and Paul. And so... uh, We read in Acts 1, verse 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus. Here he comes up again, Theophilus. Theophilus, he wrote to him, Luke, and now he's writing to him about Acts. Of all that Jesus both to do, began both to do and teach. And both Luke and Acts are dedicated to Theophilus. 
So the question is this, who was Theophilus? We don't know for sure, but we get an indication of who he is by the way that he's addressed and by his, his name. In Acts, in uh, Luke 1, 3, he writes, most excellent Theophilus. So he's a physician writing to somebody who is in authority because he uses that phrase, excellent Theophilus. He's using that as he would address somebody that is certainly in a position of authority in the community. And both Luke and Acts are dedicated to Theophilus. In the first century, when he said, when he called him most excellent Theophilus, this was an honorary title used to address both Roman and Jewish academics. So Theophilus, which is a Greek word, which is, consists of two Greek words, actually, as is usual in the Greek language, theo, meaning God, and philosophers from the verb to love. So he was a lover of God. This is what Theophilus was. And uh, a person who had a heart after God. And it's also evident that he was being discipled as a Christian, as a new believer, because it says in Luke 1 4, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you have been instructed. So we start to get a picture of who Theophilus was. He was somebody obviously in authority, obviously well uh, recognized in the community, but he'd become a Christian. And here was Luke. Uh, the beloved physician writing uh, about the whole story of the uh, birth of Christ and then the birth of the church so he might be well acquainted with those things. So Acts is a history of the early church and its process of planting and growth. It was written by an educated man to an educated man who was at the heart and, and soul of its growth. So how did the early church start and grow? We're going to look at four essentials from out of the first chapter of Acts. We get an idea of what it was like. One of the problems is this, is that when we read the Bible, we often relate what it's saying to how we feel about the community in which we live at the moment. And we try and think of what it would be like if I was writing Acts today in, in the community and attitudes of the community today. And it's totally different to what it was 2,000 years ago. And our challenge is to get into that mindset ourselves so that we begin to understand the phenomenal change that came across the lives of those Jews in the early church or in the who founded the early church who were together in the upper room after Jesus had ascended the 120 of them waiting there for what was next to happen. Here they were. You know, we'll pro probably talk more about this next week, but here they were a few weeks earlier. They'd been on the streets waving palms on Palm Sunday, welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem with the crowds welcoming their Saviour this person who was going to be ruling and reigning for them, their new prime minister, a spiritual prime minister. A few days later, he was killed, died on a cross, buried in a tomb for three days. Wonder how they felt. How do you feel when the next election, when your party that you supported so earnestly has disappeared, has been trounced. Do you feel rejected, dejected? What's the use? I supported them, I worked for them, and this is all that's happened. I think the, the saying that sums up politics so well is the one, today a rooster, tomorrow a feather duster. Nobody survives in politics. And there's a reason for that. I might share that next week. We live in a very uncertain, fickle 
society. Paul, uh, Luke writes that you might know with perfection and certainty what happened. And we've got to get that right inside our spirits and in our mind when we start reading this. We've got to transport ourselves back 2,000 years and begin to understand what they were, to understand how they reacted to what happened. And we, get, and we begin to get a new understanding of who the Spirit of God is and how the Spirit of God begins to work in our own lives. This is where we can, we can start to become emboldened by what we've been given as a church, what we've been given as an individual. So the first thing that we need to look at in verse 1 is our purpose. If you're going to plant a church, you need to know the purpose. And Paul writes in verse 1 of this chapter, uh, Paul, Luke writes in verse 1 of the chapter, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So our purpose is to replicate all that Jesus began to do and to teach. We could use another word here, vision or common objective. That's what we're here to achieve. And the common the command Jesus gave to the church in Matthew 18, verse 19, was go. And that is still the imperative of the church for the church in New Zealand. Go and build the kingdom. Instead, we find in the day to day that churches want to grow and people want to own the church. It, this is the church that I planted, and this is what, how many churches I have planted. Nothing to do with you, it's to do with the Spirit of God. It's nothing to do with me. It's God's Spirit that plants the church. It's His kingdom, it's not my church. Maybe the church I belong to, but it's His church. When we own it for ourselves, that's when the wheels fall off. And that is still the imperative of going to the church in New Zealand. Go and build the kingdom. Instead, most churches are trying to build an earthly kingdom, not Christ's kingdom. He is the king. So Matthew 28 says in verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, therefore go. Getting the message? It's a hard one. All Christians are called, called to participate in, in planting the church. Some are more gifted than others at it. But it is a corporate calling as well as an individual one. Many Christians are gifted in different ways. You know, I, I think of Sam and Dorothy Chan. Now, Sam's a a gifted accountant and finance manager. He looks after our accounts as a church. I'm saying that because we just had an AGM this morning. But as we are also aware of the, he's also aware of the command to go. So just a little while ago, he set up Christians Against Poverty, a cap money course, so that he can train himself and others to reach out to non-Christians and help them in their financial challenges and be Christ to them. Everything we do as a church should go towards our goal or vision or purpose of leading others to faith in Christ. And our common purpose as a church is firstly to do, to do what Jesus did in ministering to those in need around us. And this this world gets so in, engrossed in itself that it ignores the pain of other people's lives. Everyone has pain in this world. It goes with the territory. It's part of living. No one is exempt. And our job is to lead them to the greatest pain relief in the world, Jesus. You know why drugs are so prevalent in some sectors of our society? because they've substituted the relief they get from drugs for the relief they can get from a relationship with Jesus. 
That's the bottom line. Jesus said in Acts 10 verse 38, it says how, Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. I want you to note something which we will talk about many times as we go through Acts. It says that in this verse, God, was anoint, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Anointing simply means to come upon. And as we shall see, one of the great themes of Acts, as the planting of the church is recorded, is that people, as they step out in faith, guided by the Holy Spirit, he comes upon them and empowers them. Every page, every chapter reflects this truth. We'll be talking more about it in, in future days. So firstly, we are to do, and secondly, we are to teach. What are we to teach? We're to teach what Jesus taught. You'll find that in Luke's gospel, what Jesus taught becomes the early, what the early church taught, for that was to the then known world. So the first purpose in planting is to do and to teach. The second one is power. Second point is power. Power and witness, they go together. Teach and to do go together. Power and witness go together. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And it's interesting that the Acts of the Apostles follows through that whole pattern of Judea, Samaria, and ends up to the ends of the earth, which was probably to the, to the um, extent of the Roman Empire at that time. You read that in the last chapter of Acts. But the point is this. This is the whole point of that. We cannot witness in our own strength. God knows that. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to anoint us, to empower us for our witness. And the New Testament uses several words that are translated by the English word power. And the two main ones are exousia in the Greek and dunamis. Exousia means the delegated power, which we get whenever, you know, we're pulled up by a, a traffic police or by uh, some other a tax collector or some other one who exercises authority given to them by the elected government. We're not talking about delegated authority. We're talking about the other one that it uses, dunamis. The word which is associated with the ministry of the Holy Spirit is dunamis, from which we get the English words dynamite and dynamo, etc. It literally means power in action. Power in action. And Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive dunamis, dynamite power, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and anointed you, and you shall be my witnesses. Ready for it? When you begin to witness, listen to that still small voice of the Spirit which will be speaking through you. Power will flow through you to others when you begin it. So here are three points to remember when witnessing. Step, firstly, step out in faith. It's not how much you know, but how much you know that the Holy Spirit is upon you that's important when you're witnessing. It's where you've been in your quiet time at the beginning of the day that stands you in good stead when you begin to witness. People sense your relationship with God without you having to mention it. Have you ever had somebody say to you, what is it about you? You're different. What is it? Then you can say, it is the relationship I have with God through his Holy Spirit. And, when you, and secondly, when you start to witness, you're at risk. 
You're at risk of rejection. You're at risk of being misunderstood. You're at risk of being labelled. You're at risk of failure. But all you have to do is trust God. No risk, no faith. The Holy Spirit operates in the spiritual realm. That's the realm of God. It's not our natural realm. It is not your gift that you're using to witness. It's God speaking through you. It's his gift. Let me tell you a story a story that happened to me some years ago. I was speaking at a in India, the opening night of a campaign. And in, I was speaking in an arena which you could probably seat 20,000 odd people. There's a thousand people in there for the opening night. And I asked for, before I started speaking, I asked for someone to come forward who was in pain and I would pray for them and demonstrate to them the power of God to be released from pain. So a woman came over, came forward, she was hobbling and I kept, brought her up on stage, I prayed for her, asked God to release her. And you know what happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's moments like that. You feel the earth would open up and you could be back in the comfort of your lounge watching TV in New Zealand enjoying yourself. You're at risk. So what did I do? There was an empty seat right behind us that I'd been sitting in on the stage, so I said to her, you sit there while I preach. When I finished preaching, I looked around at her and she was just beaming at me. And I talked to her and I said, what's happened? And it turned out, while I preached, she'd been healed. The next night, I had a thousand there. Then the next night, the word got through the community of what had happened. There were 20,000 people turned up. The power of God saves an awful lot of breath. I've got to say, on the other hand, I hated it. There's nothing worse than saying, watch this and watch God and nothing happens. You're all alone and you're at risk. Thirdly, when you're witnessing, keep an ear open to the spirit, listen to him. Step out in faith, be strong. God will always come through. Not as you, not as you expect him, but as he wishes to do. So purpose, do and teach. Power, power and witness. Thirdly, prayer. Verse 14. They were in the upper room together and they began to pray. And it says this, they, they, these all continued, verse 14, with one accord in prayer and supplication with woman and Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Prayer and supplication. What is prayer and supplication? It is prayer to God which is heartfelt and humble. The quality of prayer, that is prayer and supplication, has a, has a quality of humility about it. You recognizing that there's nothing you can do that you need God there. If God's not there, nothing is going to happen. So often we go to prayer, God, I need, God, I want, God, would you change this person? And all the time God's trying to speak to us and say, listen, bother about yourself, would you? We don't hear that prayer. The only prayer we have to pray that we've authorized to pray about other people is to pray God's blessing on them. Leave it to God. 
It's prayer that doesn't ask God, I want, but prayer which says to God, help me be a better witness and a builder, not of my kingdom, but of yours, of God's kingdom. History is littered with the wreckage left by leadership who thought it was their church and not God's church and that they were going to change the world. I think the thing I appreciate about China, one of the things is that there's no Protestant denominations. There's only one Protestant church. Wish to God the same thing was here in New Zealand. Not every man doing what is right in his own eyes. Would to God that we could achieve that in New Zealand. There are four keys to planting for Max 1. Firstly, the purpose, to do and to teach what Jesus did. Secondly, power, anointed by the Holy Spirit to witness. Thirdly, prayer, prayer that is, that is humble, has humility as its essence. And lastly, they had a problem. How many churches have problems? The thing is, it, not the problem... The thing is how you solve the problem. And you do it with the power of the Spirit and with prayer and humility. And this is what blows many churches apart because people think they know and they will change the church. It's not your church to change. It's God's church. Leave it to God to change. Do your work and get in behind it. The vision of the church and you'll see it change. And the early church ran into a problem. Here's the problem. Acts one twenty. For it is written, it, Peter stood up and said, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling be a place of desolation, and let no one live in it, and let another take his place. Of course, he was talking about Judas. They'd started off with 12 apostles. They were now down to 11. And so Peter felt that they should replace Judas. On a side note, I can remember as a young man, my pastor at the time posing the question to a group of us, of young men, and he was going around giving each youth group a question to solve. And ours was, I've never forgotten, it was Judas saved. Great question. Because it depends upon your theology and what your ultimate theology is how you ask that. Was Jesus saved? Of course he was. But I add the corollary to it, while he was ministering with Jesus. But when he betrayed Jesus, he lost his salvation. There are some who say once saved, always saved. Now you've got real problems with that in the whole question of, because it says very clearly Verse 17, that Judas was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. He was obviously saved while he was with Jesus as one of the 12 apostles. But he lost it when he went against Jesus and betrayed him. When he betrayed Jesus and we have, we've got no record of his repentance, only that he committed suicide after it. He lost his salvation. Back to the problem. How to resolve Judas' departure. So they prayed. What a wonderful way to solve a problem. Prayer. And it's not prayer, change somebody's life or change this or do this God or do that God. No, the prayer was, God, here I am. Bless us, we need another to fill the position of Judas. Show us what to do. A prayer of humility. Prayer, prayer and supplication. Acts one twenty four. and they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which of these two. They had two people they were thinking of choosing. And Matthias was selected, verse 26, and they cast their lots and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. They trusted God to lead them through and solve the problem. So how do you plant a church? I'm fascinated by 
being an observer for the last couple of years because of being in, not being able to travel, of what's going on in Papua New Guinea, where we're seeing a church planted every week and a half to two weeks, they're planting another church. And they have a passion to do it God's way. They, all, they have their problems. We talk regularly and try and solve their problems from a spiritual point of view. So how do you plant a church? The answer is carefully and prayerfully by the Holy Spirit. Firstly, define your purpose and your vision. Two, as we've just said, ask for God's anointing. Three, pray for humility. And four, solve problems by prayer. In summary, we can say this about Acts. And I'd say what we need to be doing is reading each chapter ahead during the week so that when you come on Sunday and I start sharing about it, you've got an idea of where we're going. I'll probably be doing half of chapter one, chapter, uh, ch chapter two. Chapter two's got 44 verses in it. It's hard to follow that and cover that in one message. So I'll probably do two, on cha two messages on chapter two. But read it and understand it so that when we come together, we can uh, think about it and look what the word of God says. The spirit, here's the whole thing about Acts. The spirit was the midwife at the birth of the early church. It was the spirit. That's what changed them from a group of people. And I opened these words by saying, we need to understand the milieu in which they lived. They were downcast and, and downtrodden at that time. They were, as Paul writes further on, the church was regarded as the scum and off scouring of the earth the lowest of the low. But God moved by his spirit and changed them. They turned around by changing the then known world. This is they who have changed the world we know. This group of 120. I think, we think of New Zealand. New Zealand is a nation which is probably the furthest down the whole road of post-modernity that I know of of all the Western countries. I want to see it change. It'll only change by a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. No other way will it change. My prayer is that the Journey Church, as we contemplate our future, will be a church with a spirit-directed vision anointed by the Spirit, led with prayerful humility and meeting the challenges of growth with Spirit-led prayer. We've been looking at the year ahead. I'm excited. I'm excited. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, as we begin this series of the birth of the early church, we pray that we will be open and receptive as a church to the movement of your spirit, that we might be a church which is empowered by your spirit, changing the face of this nation that people might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. Father, bless us, give us hearts to hear, hearts that are open <coughs> to the moving of your spirit. Give us a sensitivity of spirit that we might hear you. I pray that in Jesus' name. This is where our heads are bowed. I was impressed when Paul spoke this morning about by his stripes we're healed. 
And I believe that. That is our right as Christians. And if you've got need of touching your body this morning, physically, just where you are, just stand. I'm going to pray because I believe God will touch you. Is there anybody here this morning? Just where you are. Just where you stand, just hold your hands out in front of you as an act of receiving, as you're going to receive something from God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against every spirit of infirmity that in that is upon those who are standing. Father, we take authority over it in your name. All power you said is given unto me. Go therefore. And so, Father, we go therefore in the power of the Spirit. We ask your healing power to touch every single person who is standing from the top of their heads, flow through them, right through their bodies to the sole of their feet that they might be touched by your Spirit and healed now in the name of Jesus. We pray it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated.